confession to make. I work at Subway, and I hate Jared. I know, but he's smug, he's conceited. But I think the real reason I hate him is because he represents an unrealistic portrayal of weight loss. In the first shot of his commercial, jolly, jiggly Jared is tipping the scales at 300 pounds. By the next shot, he's practically Paris Hilton. <laughs> Losing weight simply isn't that easy. And the pleasantly plump, as I like to refer to us, <laughs> are constantly facing pressure to seek out quick pound dropping fixes or face society's wrath. And it only gets worse when the commercial ends and my favorite show comes back on, where being fat is often associated with being lazy, stupid, or a sick little sociopath that likes cheesy poofs. <laughs> time and time again in this health class, we are discouraged from making fun of people because of race, religion, sexual orientation, Kardashian preference. <laughs> but if you want to make fun of the chunkster in the corner who just mistook a can of Silly String for spray cheese, we're told it's okay. Now, in fairness, we're an easy target. We're big, and we maneuver about as well as an Oberweiss truck. But the question remains, why does society let this occur? Ridiculing fat people only perpetuates the idea that discrimination of any type is acceptable. It's time to address the real problem. A big problem. <laughs> so let's loosen our belts and examine the problem of weightism, or weight discrimination. Then we'll go back for extra cervix and examine some causes. And finally, we'll step off the scale and look at some solutions to the persecution of the pleasantly plump. Heavy people are facing discrimination everywhere we go, and it has severe consequences on our day-to-day -day lives. An Atlantic article published on May 20, 2013, entitled Kids Are Prejudiced Against Fat People by Age 4, reports that, shockingly, kids are prejudiced against fat people <laughs> by age four. <laughs> Three groups of kids read the same story about two friends, Alfie and Thomas. In one version, the two are normal, but in the other two, Alfie is either portrayed as overweight or disabled. In a survey taken after the story was read, the children overwhelmingly decided that fat Alfie and wheelchair Alfie would be less likely to do well in school, be invited to parties, or be happy with how he looks. And if Fat Alfie was in a wheelchair, you don't want to know what the kids thought. But after these kids get out of preschool, things will get better, right? Of course not. A CNN article from September 24, 2013, reports that elementary schools in 19 states, including the great state of Illinois, have hired dietitians to measure students' body mass indices. If their BMI is found to be above normal, the parents get a letter from the school informing them that their child is obese. The other kids calling them fat wasn't enough. Now the administrators have to get in on this. <laughs> Fantastic. But unlike nose picking, glue eating, and pants pooping, this trend continues past elementary school. <laughs> the Council for Size and Weight Discrimination tells us that 90% of high school upperclassmen girls have attempted dieting, though less than 15% are above the recommended weight. The council also says that young girls are more afraid of being fat than they are of cancer losing their parents, or David Spade, topless. <laughs> so why does being fat cause society to be so hurtful? Well, our hatred for the hefty stems from our society's perception of fat. The Center for Disease Control and Prevention tells us that 165 million Americans are currently labeled as overweight or obese. That's over half the population of the country. However, the CDC goes on to say that those same 165 million tend to have lower risks of cancer, stronger immune systems, and higher life expectancies. So perhaps we need to take a look at this definition. Also, because we set unrealistic standards that inevitably lead to failure. The media bombards everyone with messages encouraging us to succeed by being thin. We've all seen the before and after pictures and heard the ridiculous testimonials like, I lost 200 pounds in 30 days! Who needs limbs? <laughs> <laughs> they not only is this simply preposterous, but these programs do not promote healthy weight loss. According to Livestrong.com, the average amount of weight lost in those testimonials is 70 pounds, an amount unattainable by the products promoted. Ironically, at the bottom of that very Livestrong article were ads promoting rapid weight loss. 
You can't even research the problem without being force fed as we perpetuate it. Additionally, fat people are getting blamed for ridiculous and irrelevant things. For example, the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine blames fat people for high energy costs, food shortages, and even global warming. I'm sorry? <laughs> so what can we do to feel better about ourselves and end this fat discrimination? Well, we need to redefine just what fat is. The Journal of the American Medical Association, January 2013, tells us that if the government were simply to redefine normal weight as one that doesn't cause major health risks, then about 80% of those 165 million would be recategorized as normal weight. Unfortunately, rarely do bullies read the Journal of the American Medical Association. <laughs> so we have to attack this problem from other directions as well. For starters, we can tell the media that we want to see a change. The Huffington Post of June 5, 2012 tells us about Julia Bloom, a 14-year-old who wanted to see a change in Seventeen magazine. She started an online petition to end the photoshopping of teen models to look thinner. 84,000 signatures later, Seventeen agreed to stop photoshopping. But while these large-scale changes will certainly help, the real solutions lie with how we perceive and treat one another. The USA Today of October 24, 2013 tells us the story of Allie Del Monte. Her torment began in the second grade when she gained weight due to a new thyroid medication. Classmates taunted her on a daily basis, and by 13, Allie couldn't take it anymore and attempted to take her own life. Just as we are taught to accept diversity in terms of race, gender, and culture, we also need to understand that people come in all shapes and sizes. And just as people who have hairy, disgusting moles don't choose to have hairy, disgusting moles, <laughs> fat people generally don't choose to be fat, nor do they choose to hang out with people with hairy, disgusting moles. <laughs> not only do we need to not take part in this tubby torment, but we need to take an active role in stopping it. If you see or hear someone being ridiculed because of their size, don't laugh. Tell them to stop. And if all else fails, warn them that you've got a bottle of barbecue sauce and an affinity for thigh meat. <laughs> <laughs> so shut up. Throughout the semester, we've discussed decision making, healthy relationships, and herpes. Lots and lots of herpes. <laughs> and as the semester comes to a close, I think it's important for us to remember that we should respect each other regardless of size. So the next time I'm at Subway talking to Jared's cardboard cutout, <laughs> I won't resent him for being thin as long as he doesn't resent me for sticking another cookie. <laughs>